me deja eh, las palabras tan cálidas, la bienvenida eh, tan linda. Es un, es un placer. It's a great pleasure being back in California. It's a great pleasure being back at Cal. And uh, I'm uh, so moved by your wonderful uh, introduction. Um, so, Dr. Guerrero, thank you. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. I want to thank the Center for Latino Policy Research and all the other centers that have made this gathering uh, possible. I'm delighted to be back at Berkeley. The plan for my lecture today is first to go over some of the most up-to-date data on global migration. As Glass said, this is not a California issue, it's not a US issue, it's not an American issue, it's the issue that will define the 21st century moving forward. Then I will share with you some of the findings from the LISA study that, uh, that Dr. Guerrero mentioned, the Longitudinal Immigrant Student um, Adaptation Study project, one of the projects of the Harvard Immigration uh, Projects. The, the um, West Coast site for that research was here in, uh, at the University of California at Berkeley, it was housed here at Cal. And what I will share with you today is some of the findings relevant to Latino education, particularly empirically the link between family separations and the academic paths of immigrant origin students. Then lastly, I will offer some reflections on how uh, migration has now become the, the human face of a global malaise that is um, engendering and transforming uh, the world almost wherever we look. Migration in the 21st century is deeply lodged in the narrative of globalization. Indeed, globalization is how we get to a world where the lives of over a billion people are shaped by the experience of migration. 214 million today are transnational migrants, an estimated 740 million internal migrants, and another 500 million plus relatives of migrants left behind. In the 21st century, the integration and the situation of markets, the brisk growth of inequality across the world, new information, communication, and media technologies, the ease of mass transportation, change in social practices and cultural models, and new demographic realities and pressures combined into the rocket fuel of globalization's migrant vertical. They have unleashed a massive migration wave which we can now precisely date. It began on November 9th, 1989, the day the Berlin Wall fell. And it perhaps came to a crash on September 15, 2008, the day Lehman Brothers filed from bankruptcy and began a, an economic crisis that affected every region on Earth. During that generation, from the late 80s, to the closing years of the first decade of the 20th century, during the heady days of the end of history and the Washington Consensus, well over a million immigrants came to our country every year for well over 20 years. Worldwide, migration went from 155 million people in 1990 to over 210 by the year 2010. Immigration in the 21st century is the human face of globalization. Globalization's utopic promise and dystopic aftermath makes cultural diversity increasingly normative in the world's mega cities. In New York City, in LA, in San Francisco, today cultural complexity defines the demographic, social, and cultural sphere. In New York City, children from 190 different countries and territories walk up this morning 
got into subways, got into buses, and went to schools. That's something that never happened before in the history of the world. One city encompasses the entire range of the human condition. In Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and The Hague, two-thirds, two-thirds of all children in schools come from immigrant homes. In Paris, a third of all children come from immigrant homes. In Milano, I was in Milano two weeks ago, a third of all children in kindergarten today come from immigrant origin homes. In Copenhagen, a fifth of all children in schools are now immigrant origin. The ideal of the German romantics of a fit between language, identity, region, and the idea of the folk, the German idea of the folk, is made increasingly anachronistic by the forces of globalization. Ours is the era of movement. Why do people migrate? Freud, at the end of his life, was asked, Professor Freud, what is the formula for a happy life? Freud's famous answer, love and work. Love and work and war explain and are at the heart of immigration's global teleology. My approach to immigration is informed by a psychosocial sensibility that locates the family at the center of the symbolic and social universe. As I will share with you this afternoon, family separations and reunifications and migration for the sake of the family unit, defined differently in various regions of the world, constitute the ethical framework for today's migration. If globalization is the macro context for migration in the 21st century, the family is the meso context. An ethic of family nurturance, reciprocity, and caregiving animates global migration in the 21st century. It is what drives Ukrainian and Uzbeks to Russia, Indians, Indonesians, and Filipinos to the Gulf countries, Senegalese, Algerians, and Moroccans to France, Chinese to Canada, Brazilians to Japan, Turks to Germany, Mexicans to California. At a time when the average wage differential between high and low income countries continues to grow, today it's on average $7,000 net of netable costs of migrating, millions and millions of workers make themselves most relevant by leaving family members behind. They are there by, by not being there. Thus, creating fragile, long distance family systems of authority, nurturance, and cohesion that today involve hundreds of millions of families the world over. But love and work, migration for the family and migration for work, always have coexisted with war. Witness the Reagan era uh, uh, war, various wars in Central America that led to a massive, unprecedented exodus of Guatemalan, Salvadorians, Nicaraguans, and Hondurans to the United States. Love, war, war. And moving forward, we're going to increasingly see something we first, perhaps, began to sense in the late 90s when a when in Honduras, when a devastating hurricane forced 2.5 million folk to leave their homes. Many began a massive exodus to the United States. Today, perhaps 25 million people are environmental migrants, or we may call them environmental refugees, a figure that according to the United Nations Population Division is likely to grow to 200 million people by the year 2050. There are now over 210 million transnational migrants worldwide, roughly 3.1% of the global population. Immigration is transforming more and less developed nations the world over. On average, the rate of immigration today is 10, time, 10 times higher in the high income countries in the world than in the developing nations. At approximately 43 million migrants, the US now has more than three times, more than three times the number of the second largest country of immigration today, the Russian Federation. It also has, amazingly, approximately 20% 
of the world's entire undocumented immigrant population. We're less than 5% of the people on Earth, the United States, yet we account for roughly 20% of all unauthorized migrants worldwide. Since 1990, well over a million new immigrants have come to our country, a complex mix of authorized and unauthorized new arrivals. Next, please. Europe, the continent that a century ago shed approximately 60 million of its souls during the great transoceanic exodus, now leads the way in international migration. It's like Europe is reclaiming every immigrant it sent away a hundred years ago. It's as if we are seeing the closing of a cycle. Leicester in England will shortly become the first Euro European city with a non-white majority. Of course, you all live in a state that is a minority majority state, like Hawaii, like New Mexico, like Texas. But Frankfurt today is 30% immigrant. Rotterdam is 45% immigrant, the largest port in the heart of Europe, 45% uh, immigrant. Amsterdam is going to be half immigrant by the midpoint of the next decade, half immigrant. Sweden, Sweden, which last month sent shockwaves waves through the world by voting into parliament the anti-immigrant, the monomaniacally anti-immigrant Swedish Democrats into parliament, um, it, it's a country that of 9 million people, today it has 1.5 million immigrants. You do the math, the rate of immigration in Sweden today is greater than the, grade of, the rate of immigration in the United States. In fact, Sweden sent about a million plus immigrants to the US 100 years ago. It's now completely reclaimed them. Of course, the immigrants originating in vastly different regions of the world. Spain, seemingly in an island, went from being the archetypical country of emigration. Today, it is one of the top 10 destinations for new immigrants in the world. Italy and Ireland show a similar rapid rate of growth. But like in almost everything else in the 21st century, the epicenter of the movement of people moving forward is Asia. It's not North America, it's not Europe. China alone today has over 150 million, over 150 million internal migrants. Populations that are marked by language, ethnicity, and unauthorized status. I was giving lectures in Beijing, and I was taking, recently, and I was taken to a school for undocumented children. How can you be an undocumented child in your own country? Well, I learned in China, you can. In India, 31, 31 rural to urban migrants per minute, per minute, are arriving in cities for a total estimate of uh, well over 600 million by the midpoint of the 21st century. In the US, we talk about the new immigration. I want to introduce an idea called the new, new immigration. By 2008, nine of the top 10 countries of immigration, of sending immigrants to the United States were Latin American, Caribbean, and Asian, constituting the heart of the so-called new immigration. One third of the foreign born population of the United States is now Mexican, and well over 50% is of Latin American origin. Two notable recent developments, what we call the new, new immigration. Department of Homeland Security estimates released last month suggest that unauthorized immigrant, immigrate, an authorized immigrant population living in the United States decreased to 10.8 million in January 2009 from 11.6 million a year later. Furthermore, it estimates that the estimated annual inflow of unauthorized immigrants to the United States is now two-thirds smaller, if, if you look at the data from March 2007 to March 2009, than it had been from March 2000 to March 2005. According to new estimates by the Pew Hispanic Center, this reverses a pattern of nearly three decades of unauthorized immigration to the United States. Here's the triumph of the market over the architecture of the nation state. The collapse of Lehman Brothers did achieve what 9-11 failed to achieve. It fundamentally reversed and substantially reduced a pattern of unauthorized immigration for the United States, from the, 
into the United States in, uh, uh, in nearly 30 years. The collapse of Lehman Brothers did what the largest concentration of state power between two, democrat two democracies at peacetime was unable to achieve. The so-called sealing of the border at the southern sector could not do what 9-11 and 9-11 could not do what the collapse of Lehman Brothers did. Is this the new normal in immigration today? Perhaps the new normal will be a word, maybe described in a word, inertia. Would be returnees to their countries are staying put, as are those which under the previous regime might have considered migrating without authorization. Any expectations that the economic debacle would result in massive self-deportations has not materialized. It's really the massive unprecedented deportations under the Obama administration, roughly now we're deporting 100,000 people more than under the Bush regime, under the new administration. Likewise, there has been no change in the patterns of legal, read family, read love immigration to the United States. Immigration at its core is an ethical move, off and for the family. But under the best of circumstances, it generates a severe psychosocial disequilibrium. The stopic state policies further subvert the family in the Lacanian sense of its legislative, social, and symbolic forms. State policies de facto and de jure dismember millions of families. Millions of families are separated, millions are deported. We're at over 390,000 uh, last, last, last fiscal year, and millions more inhabit a subterranean world of illegality. In 2009, there were 1.1 million unauthorized children and an additional 4 million citizen children growing up in households headed by at least one unauthorized migrant. To paraphrase Tolstoy, all immigrant families are unhappy the same way. Separations and reunifications, as we will see shortly, define the immigrant experience in the 21st century. While immigrants, especially males, typically experience significant status demotions, their lifetime economic gains are immense. Today, approximately four family members, four family members, depend on remittances sent by every Latino <coughs> immigrant working and living in the United States. While the rate of remittances globally has slowed down since the economic collapse, it remains proportionately higher than any other flows. It may constitute what the World Bank has recently called, quote, the world's largest poverty reduction effort. Immigration generates a powerful echo. As families reunify and new families form, the children of immigrants take center stage. In the US, as in dozens of high-income countries, the children of immigrants are now the fastest growing sector of the child population and the majority of all growth moving forward. Today, one in five children in the United States is the child of an immigrant and 25% 25% of all children under five are now Latinos. They are projected to be more than one in three by the year 2030. Indeed, a recent report by Pew suggests, quote, never before in US history has a minority ethnic group made up so large a share of the youngest Americans, end of quote. This is happening in the context of another unprecedented demographic transformation unfolding in the United States and in many other high-income countries. Make matter, matters more, more interesting, mass migration is happening in the context of a transgenerational shift happening in our country, happening in Ireland, in Germany, in Spain, in Greece, Russia, Japan, and many other high-income countries. Rapidly aging native populations 
now about to enter the demographic winter of their lives. In the United States, over 80 million baby boomers, the vast majority of them of white, European, non-immigrant origin, will retire shortly, generating an unprecedented void in various sectors of the economy and society. But with the transition of new immigrants, the transition of new immigrants, I think you have to keep on clicking. Okay. I thought you, I thought it was <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. We didn't coordinate this. <laughs> My computer broke in the plane on the way here from New York this morning, so we uh, coffee. The transition of new immigrants via education is now the problem that defines education in our country and arguably in every other high-income country as the shockwaves sent by the latest PISA data reveal we're not alone. The Germans are doing a disastrous job in teaching their immigrant origin children. Uh, the Italians, the Spaniards, the French, uh, everywhere, everywhere you look, the challenge of making the transition of the children of immigrants into citizenship, into the narrative of the nation, into the labor market, is the fundamental challenge of every high-income country in the, 24, in the 21st century. Nowhere is the failure to educate high numbers of immigrant origin youth to fully engage in the opportunities afforded by the well-remunerated knowledge-intensive sector of the economy than in the sad statistics capturing the so-called pipeline problem facing Latino youth. Especially, and this is something uh, Dr. Guerrero and I were talking earlier today, worrisome for Latinos who arrive as migrants during the midpoint of their careers, of their studies. The story you have here. Now, turning briefly to a study that sh sheds light uh, in terms of longitudinal design uh, and the continuities and discontinuities in educational adaptations among a sample of 400 newly arrived immigrant youth. Um, this is a study of youth ages 9 to 14 at the beginning of the study. Children originated in multiple Central American countries, including Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Honduras, as well as children originating in China, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, and Mexico, with Boston and San Francisco areas research sites. Two of the most relevant scientific findings. Immigration, our study suggested, is about the making and unmaking and remaking of the family. It is structured by centrifugal and centripetal fields, taking families apart and bringing them together again, but in deeply transformed ways. As mothers, and today, for the first time in human history, half of all migrants worldwide are women. As mothers and fathers migrate, their children are typically left behind. LISA data, that's the Longitudinal Immigrant Student Adaptation Study of the Harvard Immigration Project, consisting of a normative sample of approximately 400 newly arrived immigrant youngsters and their families, originating in Asia, Caribbean and Latin America, revealed that 85%, this is a normative sample, 85% of the youth became separated from immediate family members during the migratory journey. From whom the child was separated, there were significant differences between immigrant groups participating in the LISA study. Families from Chinese origin tended to migrate as a unit much more frequently, but while the circumstances of migration for Haitian and Central American <coughs> families imposed separations during migration in nearly all the cases, 96% of the cases for Haitian children and for Central American children. Next. Immigrant children today, as they were historically, are most likely to become separated by their, from their fathers. This was the case in our sample in 79% 79 of the study. It occurred in 96% of the Central American families 
the over 80% of the Dominican, Haitian, and Mexican families. It was least likely to occur among Chinese but it's immigrants, but it still occurred in nearly half the cases. When separations from the father occurs during migration, it is often a very lengthy process. For those families who were separated, over half had separations from fathers that lasted five years or more. Next. Even as the family is the bedrock of migration and at the very center of the conceptual policy framework for migration in most advanced post-industrial societies, the process of migration deeply destabilizes the social unit. Immigrant children are strangers at home and abroad. Read the references to these spontaneous uh, reflections from kids when they talk about their relatives as strangers upon reunification. Our current migration policy architecture makes family separations normative. Immigrant families are routinely separating and waiting to reunify. Those who argue, why can't the illegals get on line, don't understand there is no line to get on. Today there are three million, three million relatives of US citizens and permanent lawful residents waiting endlessly in limbo to legally reunify with their relatives already in the United States. There are well over half a million uh, in minor children and uh, uh, siblings, other siblings, and older children of legal permanent uh, residents and US citizens waiting patiently for their visas. The crisis of unauthorized immigration further undermines the family's symbolic coherence and social cohesion. Who among the 5.1 million children, 4 million citizen children with at least one unauthorized parent, and another estimated 1.1 million children without authorization feel free at home when hundreds of thousands of folks are deported every year? What are the lasting sequela, sequelae of the home invasion pre-raids, pre-dawn raids, perfected during the Bush administration's shock and awe migration initiative when the machinery of the state came, came to mimic the so-called immigrant invasion of the nation, the dominant folk model in the 21st century of immigration in troubled times. These millions of children, citizens de jour, but de facto orphans of the state, lose their right to quote from perhaps the most important chapter in Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, totalitarianism. These are the children who write, who lose the right to have rights. These are millions of children who are a subcast of citizens for whom the 14th Amendment, where all persons born or naturalized in the US are citizens of the US, remains an elusive mirage. Family separations, furthermore, are empirically tied to patterns of academic engagement. This is a very important finding from the longitudinal study. If you, we can quickly, we did a model um, looking at the best predictor of grades and performance in, on standardized tests among the children. This is all immensely tedious statistically, and I'm not going to bore you with the details. You can read the book, you can read the articles. I just want to uh, uh, make the argument that uh, when you Plug in the usual suspects, behavioral engagement, that is, the doing the work of school, and English proficiency uh, are very powerful predictors of grades you know, over time in, and across the grades in the lives of, of the, the children uh, in our study. When we substitute grades for achievement tests, we found a breathtaking dynamic at play. This is exactly the same model one model we had grades at the end of the study. In another model we had a 
standardized achievement tests, very, very similar to the kinds of tests kids have to take in the uh, No Child Left Behind regime of education and, and testing today. Um, next. When all of a sudden we could explain, if, if you, you go back one more, Sorry. you can just go, go back one more. 75% uh, of the variance, those of you who already took your statistics class know that this is impossible, there's something deeply wrong with this. When we removed English language proficiency, we accounted for 11% uh, of the variance, meaning that if, if your yardstick is going to be performance on standardized tests, essentially what you're measuring is the child's ability to function in, academic, in an academic um, uh, uh, language and all the other factors uh, pale in uh, comparison. We discovered um, that th this is the normal distribution of second language proficiency. The bell curve is in yellow, the magenta curve is the story of the kids in our sample. After seven years in the United States, only a tiny minority of the kids could co compete in standardized, timed, high achievement tests with their native born. English speaking peers. Next. We found uh, a variety of pathways. This is a Nagin's cluster analysis. Uh, and unfortunately, the story we had to tell is one of decline, not improvement over time. Length of residence in our country is for the majority of the kids uh, today predictive of lower academic engagement and performance, not higher academic engagement and performance. Is something we established earlier in the, in the work uh, that uh, Blas mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, we we, we uh, found various pathways, including the pathways of children that decline over time, children that start as low achieving and remain low achieving. Uh, next, the cases of the children who improve over time, only a small minority of kids end up doing better rather than worse. Time, and then we looked at uh, the, the trajectories of children who start doing very well, they enter the country, say, flying at 40,000 feet, and throughout they maintain a very high level of academic achievement. And overall, the story is one of academic decline, not academic improvement. Next. This is a photo from down the street. I used to live in San Diego, California, before I moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts. And this was on the, my way to, to my office. Uh, I took that, uh, that, uh, that photograph. Immigration in the 21st century is at once local, global, timely, and eternal, familial, and uncanny. The story of immigration during the first decade of the 21st century is a story dripping with paradoxes and ironies. It is a story of the unbearable normalcy of human movement. Only 3.1% of the world's global population is on the move. Yet, this manages to contaminate migrants and their hosts alike with deep feelings of dislocation, mourning, and enemy. While more people are now on the move than ever before, international migration has remained amazingly stable over the last three generations, 60 years. This is the case after three generations of vaguely apocalyptic predictions forecasting the imminent uncontainable movement of people emanating from multiple sources. In the alia, the so-called population explosion in the south, the demographic decline of the North, climatic catastrophes and deepening environmental degradation, the end of the Cold War, the increase in ethno-religious armed conflict worldwide, growing global income differentials, and the ever-declining costs of travel. Also considering capital's voracious appetite for ever more flexible re-immigrant workers to complement the skills of native workers and nine the multiple, perhaps early obituaries of the nation state and the triumph over the global 
over the local. The fundamental lesson of three generations of basic research in global on global migration is whether the potential for immigration continues to grow, the reality of international migration remain, remains amazingly stable. If transnational migration has been stable, it has also been highly dystopic. The United States, a country invented by five massive waves of voluntary and involuntary migrations, including, of course, the early arrival of the European explorers, the mass involuntary transfer of African slaves, the subsequent great African American migration from the South, the great transoceanic migration of the last century, and the ongoing so called new immigration. That country, the country that was invented by immigration, ends up having the largest number of unauthorized immigrants in the world, the equivalent of the entire populations of Denmark and Switzerland combined. The advanced nation states policy architecture for managing migration is hopelessly misaligned with the realities of economy and society in the era of global integration and disintegration. Over the last three generations, the advanced post-industrial world and the global south have entered into a bad faith agreement. Mass migration with eyes wide shut. Migration's default position now is contrary. The anti-immigration sentiment saturates, contaminates, is radioactive in the public sphere. Most claims in the public domain, in the public sphere, for or against immigration are formulaic, underwhelming, and lack the seriousness the magnitude of the human dilemma demands. Chancellor Merkel's breathtaking denunciation last week of the failure of immigration, the failure of what the Germans call multi-culti, uh, takes one's breath away because Germany never had a serious debate. Neither did we on the ends or purposes of immigration. There hasn't been that conversation. What is the end of immigration? What is the purpose of immigration? Why do countries have immigrants? This is a conversation that we haven't had in either side of the Atlantic. A number of European nations sleepwalked into what now some see as an immigration nightmare without even the most banal sense of what exactly mass migration would entail. The guest worker programs of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, which amazingly are being resuscitated today, albeit in more boutique form, were the lowest of the low-hanging fruit, policy-wise, entered for superficial reasons as short-term short temporary fixes. It turns out that nothing has been more permanent than temporary guest worker programs. The, govern, the, govern, the governing elites of the global south have become addicted to mass immigration for their own, often dubious ends. Last month I debated the president of Mexico in Arizona, of all places, in Phoenix. You can see it at the Google Zeitgeist, it's in our website, the debate. It just takes your breath away how the, the uh, uh, elites in South America and Latin America think about uh, why the people leave their countries. So uh, get into the webpage of immigration studies at NYU, and you, you can see the debate we had in Arizona, the, the, the former president Fox and I on this topic. The immigrants themselves typically enter the bargain without a full sense of the Faustian deal they've signed. Economic gains are often paid for in the currency of status demotions, loss of voice, and more or less perpetual mourning. Finally, for the world's involuntary migrants, the children of immigration, it is the best of times and it is the worst of times. Never before 
in the history of the United States have so many immigrant children headed for Cal or for Harvard or for Princeton, but also never before have so many headed for the criminal justice system. Look up the statistics on the incarceration rates among the children of immigrants in Denmark, France, the Netherlands, and your drop of job will drop. Immigration finally makes and unmakes the world. It changes everything it touches. The countries left behind, the new countries, and above all, the immigrants themselves. Immigration is not for the faint of heart. When it comes to immigration, it's best to proceed with caution and be careful what you wish for. Thank you very much. So we have some time for question and answer period. If folks, I can get this off. Pass this around. Glass of water. Takers. If you could introduce yourself, please, and then. Good afternoon. My name is Chela Rios Munoz, and I work at Children's Hospital Open here down the road. And thank you for your work and your presentation today. I wondered if you could speak a little bit about the group of um, immigrants that we're seeing more and more, and that is children that migrate by themselves. We were talking about uh, this uh, earlier. Many children not even in, not, um, are not registered in the basic statistics that schools and the uh, Department of Education compiles because they never uh, fundamentally drop into the schooling system. Um, there are hundreds of thousands, uh, possibly just from Mexico alone, about a million kids who never really uh, enter U.S. educational institutions uh, simply because they enter the labor market and they are kept uh, below the radar, uh, the radar screen. So, um, uh, patterns of family reunification, patterns of the delay arrival of immigrant origin uh, children is a global concern. Our data, other data suggest that the normative ideal of the entire family unit migrating together is an elusive, elusive, reality in the 21st century. And the transnational flows are both ways. We have children migrating on their own to our country. We also have children being sent back to be raised in their countries of origin after a birth in the United States. In, in, in important new research looking at the patterns by which immigrants from China and other regions of the world are sending their children back <coughs> to be raised by grandparents, by others, and then brought back to the U.S. Uh, when they're ready to start, uh, to start school is part of this new uh, set of arrangements. In general, the, the conceptual flaw in the study of immigration has been tied to insisting on immigration as a labor market proposition. Immigration is not about workers. Immigration is about human beings. We can't have economies that become heavily reliant, addicted to immigrant labor, and not fully consciously understand that with labor, families, and children will become an integral part of the story. So this has been all below the radar screen. Migration has been approached as a mechanical problem that can be managed according to the, to the complexities of the business cycle. And as the current crisis has taught us, uh, far from that being the case, what the current condition in the business cycle has generated is a, is a freezing on all sides of the farther movement of people. Um, I just want to say thank you again for your presentation for coming here. 
Um, I have two questions. So I grew up in, in Calexico in Mexicali, which is a border town. So I was going to school in the US, but then I had to go to work in Mexicali every day. Um, and there's not, I'm having a hard time finding material. Actually, I'm here because of Professor um, Blas Gutierrez's efforts to outreach because I didn't find out where UC Berkeley was until the day of, the week of UC applications. So if it wasn't for that outreach, I would, that would definitely not be here at all. Um, so I guess in this language of immigrant families and all that stuff, um, I have, I've had a hard time finding studies and research being done in border areas where the, where the children and the families live in two cities, like they have a, feet in Mexico, a foot in Mexico and a foot in the US, and how that affects their, um, their identity. I was saying like, I belong, I belong just enough to be a farm worker in the US or a worker, but I don't belong enough to go to college and university. That's the first one. And my second question is more asking for your advice. Right now at UC Berkeley, we have this big issue that um, this year we have a 12% Latino drop, a 4% African American, um, so on and so forth, different Filipino, different um, communities. And in our conversations, it's gotten to the point of, if we want UC Berkeley to look more reflective of the state, it needs to be more Latino. So all of a sudden, this conversation of like, oh, well, we prefer Latinos over Filipinos and Latinos over African Americans is really dangerous, at least for me, I don't really like it. So I, I don't know how you would address those two. Thank you, thank you so much. So in the first question, there is some uh, interesting work. I mean, I don't know how much um, might be relevant or useful for your thinking or for your research or for your studies as you move forward on the issues that are specifically uh, pertinent to uh, border uh, um, growing up sort of on, on both sides, here and there um, of the border. Let me, uh, I just recently wrote a blurb for a book published by the University of California Press, I'm sure Lisa was involved in the production of that book, by somebody who teaches here at the School of Journalism, uh, called The Wind Doesn't Need a Passport by Taiki Hendricks. Uh, it's a very beautiful yeah. compilation of stories about the border. So it's called The Wind Doesn't Need a Passport. Stories of the, the Borderlands, I think is the subtitle. Uh, and so there are, um, uh, there are some such uh, studies. I, I lived on the other side of the border. I lived in, the, uh, in Rancho Peñasquitos on the, on the on the U.S. side, in uh, of the of, of, of in, in here in Southern California for many years, uh, I never studied the issue of the border as a kind of a cultural or economic or social contact zone. Um, but I'm happy to. I mean, Taiki Hendricks would be a good point of uh, of, uh, of reference for you and a point of departure. You can email her or go see her. She teaches in the School of Journalism uh, here. Uh, in terms of the second issue, is that in terms of the second issue, is the, the issue is the, the data, the demographics that we are all perfectly aware uh, today, right? Never before in the history of the United States has so much depended on what will happen with the transition of this fastest growing sector of new Americans, which are the children of overwhelmingly Latino, Latino immigrants. Again, the U.S. is not alone in this, and nor is it particularly new historically, right? The Lower East Side of New York. And years ago, half the kids in the schools came from Irish, Italians, Eastern European homes. And a lot of them didn't really have papers. I mean, the US started sort of uh, trying to manage and regulate immigration relatively late. So there's a blurred issue there as to what exactly was, who exactly was legal or not legal 100 years ago. So there is a precedent uh, for that. But I think more urgently is the fact that the California economy, the American economy, the German economy, the French economy, the Swedish economy, you name it, the Norwegian economy, is in the long term uh, unviable without a massive, proactive, not the kind of blasé, laissez-faire, lazy way in which we approach the integration of immigrants. We've been drunk with a fantasy that in our country, the logic of the market and the magic of American culture will take care of all assimilation and cooperation <coughs> and all transculturation. And that has failed. It has failed uh, miserably. It has failed in other countries as well, in Germany. Uh, when the PISA data were released, the PISA is the program for international student testing, I mean, these are the comparative tests. 
it sent, I was in, in Berlin when the piece of data were released, it sent, sent shockwaves because the Germans understood that they're not educating their children, their minority children, remember the fastest growing sector of the child population is now in the origin in Germany as well as in Sweden, in France, in Italy, in Spain. Uh, so, uh, in, in a way, uh, there, this is not really altruistic, this is not uh, anything other than a, a uh, raw self-interest in thinking through what will your country, what will your economy, what will your society look like moving forward. The American economy today is generating this much space for, for kids that are unable to compete in the jobs that are increasingly uh, uh, more competitive as the integration and disintegration of markets uh, makes the global competition the fundamental uh, formation of the, of the 21st century. So, you have to educate your, what's the purpose, Let's, let me ask you a basic question, what's the purpose of education? Why do you educate people, right? You can think in terms of three fundamental domains. We start with a very ancient Aristotelian idea, right? The eudaimonic idea of education for doing and living well, right? Aristotle put it very, very beautiful. Education for flourishing of human potential, right? We also think in terms of education and the civic engagement, the civic domain. You need to have citizens that are thoughtful, be able to be architects and agents of their own destiny. You need to have a civically engaged citizenship in order to face the complex problems of the 21st century. So you have a paradigm of education for the Eudaimonic idea, Greek idea of flourishing, of doing well, of living well. You have a, a paradigm of education for civic engagement. And you have a par paradigm of education for the kinds of jobs, the kind of labor market that will increasingly dominate the economies of the 21st century. How then can you map that into the demographic transformations I shared with you this afternoon when the fastest growing sector of your new population, those are your citizens, those are your workers, those are going to be the doctors and the cops and the, and the nurses and the firemen of your state. This is not uh, some, uh, what Bla said, abstract sort of problem that is happening out there. This is, has an urgent uh, implication especially for a state like, like California, especially in my state of, uh, of New York. Half the kids in the New York schools come from immigrant homes. Half. We're back to where we were in the, uh, you know, in the Lower East Side 100 years ago. It was exactly back where we were. The question is that we're going to um, um, act in a humane, in a lawful, in a way, in a self-interested way, in managing the transition of these new Americans into the family of the nation, into the labor market, into the practice of citizenship? Or are we going to just shut off the light in the Statue of Liberty, close shop and say, no, we're not going to go any longer. Keep that side of the social compact. Education divergence rate over 15 years is actually excellent. Um, there are problems, and there are problems with the politics of the countries and so on. But, I mean, yes, France, Germany, I'm afraid the USA, but there are some systems that do actually work. Terrific, thank you so much. Thank you for that question. My son just came back from um, doing an internship three months in Wellington, New Zealand, and he fell in love, and he wants to move to New Zealand, so he'll be a, a, a Latino migrant from California who is moving to New Zealand, uh, in part because he fell in love with your country and with its democratic um, impulses. Um, I think it was Mark Twain who said New Zealand was really founded by Scots who had thought they were on their way to heaven and they thought they had arrived, but uh, actually it was New Zealand, it wasn't heaven. Um, so, good point, very, very good point. Uh, you know, the US, like New Zealand, like Canada, like Australia, uh, like uh, other countries, a handful of other countries, uh, are in places where immigration is both history and destiny. Right? It's what made these countries what they are, and it's the future of these countries. That's uh, the case of, uh, of the U.S., that's the case of Canada, uh, and that's the case of, uh, 
uh, New Zealand, and that's the case of Australia. So yes, the rate of immigration in all these countries is higher than in the United States, and in Canada, uh, uh, in Canada, in Toronto last week, it's roughly 20% of the population is immigrant, where roughly 13% of our population uh, is immigrant. I think, I believe in Australia, if you correct me, but I think it's over, slightly over 20% of the population now is immigrant. 23, 23, 23 and 24, and New Zealand is 24? Uh, in Australia, it's 24 New Zealand. Yeah, 20. So these are, these, again, A, we're not alone, and B, many, many other countries have uh, been more successful, and that's a very important point, and I'm glad you, you asked, um, you, you, brought, um, you brought that up. I would say, in general, we, we did a, a, a project with the NSF and with the Bertelsmann Foundation, actually, uh, looking very, very systematically at the sort of comparative patterns of integration in, in various domains. And um, uh, Toronto did very, very well. Canada did very, very well in terms of easing the transition of immigrants into really various domains of Canadian economy and society. I would, in general, say the following. Countries that link, policy-wise, their immigration objectives to their labor market issues, to their citizenship issues, language uh, issues, and the like tend to be much, much more successful. Again, this is the, the theory of, or the, or the practice of, being uh, proactive, of taking on immigration, not through a kind of laissez-faire, que se da, se da, they'll come, uh, the culture will take care of it, the American culture is magical and they will take care of it, and of course the market, we all know now, is the solution to all our problems. We know this very well in lower Manhattan, where I work, right? Wall Street solved all the problems of our country. Um, so uh, that's that's a very good point. We can learn a great deal. We we did a a, a, a project. You can get into our website, Immigration Studies at NYU, and we have a website that was funded with the NSF project, and with the, uh, we also uh, grant from the Western Union Foundation to go back getting money from the devil um, to look at best practices. So we have a. a an elaborate study looking at what can we learn from programs in, in New Zealand, from programs in Canada. So we highlight uh, the Toronto schools, for example, wrap around. This is sort of Jeff Canada on steroids. They do everything and they're very, very good at sort of very actively engaging with, uh, with their immigrant uh, communities. We have wonderful programs from Italy, from young people, young Muslim uh, immigrants, for example. Very interesting, good programs from Germany. Uh, Mama Learns Dutch, to bring in mothers into the schools, uh, wonderful programs um, from the UK. So if you look, it's called Pathways to Immigrant Opportunity in our, on our website, it's Immigration Studies at NYU. We try to systematically do that. So thank you for, for your comment. And there are, there are very good examples of programs where we can learn and where we don't need to reinvent the wheel, including, by the way, programs in our country, in the US. There are marvelous programs in New York, in Texas, in California that we've looked at, and we could all learn a great deal from those programs. Hi, uh, Sandra Nichols. I'm in the geography department here on campus. It's very good to have you here. Thank you. Um, I study Mexican migration, primarily transnational communities, so I'm always thinking of both sides of the, the picture. And I was um, interested in going to see the, the debate you had with Santa Fox. Uh, because it really is a codependence you know, between you know, sending and receiving um, countries. And I was wondering, um, I, I also look at the migration and development, and you know there's a whole move at the UN level and conferences now, so people get to have you know, travel expenses and go off to <laughs> interesting places. I'm More than that, I Into hopefully. Puerto Vallarta, and yeah. talk about <laughs> what it does and doesn't work, but anyway. Uh, was, and they're already looking at the bilateral kinds of relationships uh, between what you know, migrants themselves can do in terms of development in their home regions to make a difference. But I was wondering at the level of um, bilateral arrangements around uh, migration to, to move it beyond just incorporation issues, which are really important, but you know, who is moving in that direction? Are there any best practices? I mean, we, the classic example, of course, was the Bracero program, all of those problems, and at least it was an agreement between two countries. I was wondering what's um, happening on that level, um, what you can talk about. 
you know, let me just share a story. Um, my, um, my now colleague at NYU, the former Mexican foreign minister, Jorge Castaneda, uh, talks about being, um, he was the foreign minister, being in the White House uh, with General Powell, with Condi Rice, uh, and uh, they had worked out, as he famously put it, the whole enchilada, right? This is going to be a massive. Uh, remember the cowboy president, what was his first uh, formal foreign act when he became president? I mean, typically the U.S. president goes where? I go to the court of St. James. He goes maybe to the Elise Palace, maybe to the Bundestag. Typically, the U.S. president's first act of power in foreign affairs is not going to a ranch in Guanajuato, Mexico, to hang out with another cowboy, right? What was the meaning of the two cowboys? They had all worked out. It was all, it was a done deal, the whole enchilada. This was the first week of September. And then what happened? 9-11 happened, and that put a huge bracket. And what otherwise would have been what will inevitably once again be a much, much more meaningfully, seriously, authentically bilateral approach to immigration essentially became um, a unilateral um, regime where our ability to engage seriously with the interests, with the power, uh, with the potential of our interlocutors south, south of the border became completely interrupted and deformed. And I think unfortunately the so-called war on drugs adds another level of complication to meaningful, authentic, multilateral, bilateral engagements Immigration, including unauthorized immigration, is not a problem to be fixed. It can be fixed. Can be, you know, this is where I, <laughs> the political class sort of stops li listening. Uh, the United States is always going to have unauthorized immigration. Right? The, push, the issue is, are we at a tipping point now? I mean, can you have six, you know, five million, five point one million children sort of live in this limbo? Can you have 11 million people without papers? Is there a tipping point? where citizenship, or the practice of law, where the kind of the regime of the state becomes uh, very sort of difficult uh, to manage. So, in a way everybody understands that managing migration in the 21st century will require a multilateral symphony of, of agreements and of understandings with multiple voices at the table. This is not happening. I asked three Mexican presidents, three consecutive Mexican presidents. They couldn't even bring the I word to NAFTA. I asked Cedillo, I asked Salinas, I asked Vicente Fox. The imbalance is how deforming the radioactivity of immigration has become to the political process is such that we can't have a serious conversation. Bush failed twice. Obama was telling uh, our colleagues over lunch. I was in the Senate a year ago. Um, and uh, Senator Menendez and Senator Durbin were getting they just come back from the White House. And the College Board had released a study. I brought the introduction to the study. They asked me to come and say a few words. And they just come back from the White House. And they were getting on how they were going to pass comprehensive immigration reform and how every Latino was going to vote for the Democrats forever and ever, but secula seculorum in posterity. And look what we're today. They couldn't even pass the Dream Act to, uh, last month. So I'm very pessimistic. It, on the one hand, it's very obvious that this is not rocket science, uh, what, it, what will uh, be required. On the other, uh, Bush couldn't do it. Really, it was Reagan, the last person who could kind of work a deal on, on immigration reform, which is really amazing to think. Very unlikely that anything will happen in the second part of the Obama administration. It may be that if Obama it turns out to be a one 
Trump president, then we're going to really end up with a Nixon to China moment. Only the, 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 the young people won't know what that means, but it may be that a conservative Republican will be the one that can make the deal, which is what Bush and all of this. Um, well, I just leave that blank, you know. Just, uh, uh, he thought he could do it, that he could make a deal. He could make a deal with Fox, and he could make a deal, more importantly, with the, with the uh, Republicans. So it may be that that's what we're waiting for. I'm very pessimistic now. I don't think we're going to be seeing intelligent bilateral engagements. I think we're going to continue down a very, very negative road. Hi, um, my name is Daisy Vargas, and I was wondering if you could please speak on the role and um, impact of smuggling and trafficking among people from Latin America and in their efforts to cross the border. So this is another one of the casualties, you know. Uh, unauthorized immigration uh, has gone from being essentially either a self-smuggling act or a kind of a smuggling in the hands of a kind of a mom and pop operation to increasingly globalized, criminalized, highly effective and highly ruthless transnational global criminal networks. So today the average cost of crossing the southern sector is probably in the order of three to five thousand dollars, which is a fortune. Uh, if you're coming in from China into Chinatown in New York with the snakeheads from Russia, from India from China, they're probably paying twenty to thirty thousand dollars. Those are the going rates. So, sealing the border, we now have drones, by the way, patrolling. The same drones that are patrolling the Afghanistan Pakistan border are patrolling the southern sector of two democracies at peace, our second largest trading partner. Um, is generated basically three things. A, the deaths at the border have skyrocketed. When the data for the summer are finally counted, and there's a huge problem of undercount, more people will have died last year trying to come to the United States than ever before in the history of the country. Second, <coughs> The costs of making the journey have skyrocketed with the emergence of uh, increasing the uh, boutique criminal enterprises to move people in and out of, uh, of, uh, of the country. And basic civil uh, liberties uh, are having constantly eroded and are under siege. I mean, you have a state where the fundamental cornerstone of what we call democracy, due process, probable cause, is being completely uh, thrown over uh, uh, board in the name of the need to approach immigration in the context of the national security regime. So I would say that those are the three fundamental casualties of uh, this dystopic, dysfunctional uh, immigration uh, system that we have in place. Hello, my name is Sonia Fernetta. I'm uh, on the uh, ESL faculty at Laney College, which is a community college in Oakland. I know Laney. And um, I just also want to thank you for your, for your speech. And I want to say that we have a lot of problems getting Latino students into, into our college. And one of the biggest, I mean, the biggest stumbling block is documentation. And so I'm so glad, you know, you're, you've been focusing on that. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be solved, this problem, until that problem is solved. Yeah, thank you so much. We just got a large grant from um, a couple of foundations to systematically study the issues of, uh, of, um, uh, of undocumented um, students in community colleges in, in New York City. And of course, New York is not the United States, I, I would say. It's not very representative in some ways. Uh, but I 
think the lessons are um, um, that we're beginning to um, discern from, from this, this study will um, hopefully have more relevance for what we are going to need to do once um, we move out of the current gridlock and paralysis and we uh, lawfully, humanely, and intelligently address the problem of children and youth who are de facto but not de jure citizens of our country. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Lisa Chavez. I'm a lecturer here at, at um, Berkeley Chicano Studies. And I teach a class on Latinos in education. It's always um, really interesting to talk about the topic of immigrants and education. Lisa, weren't you at Harvard once uh, when I was there? Yes. See, I'm not that old. I can still recognize you. Good to see you. Do you remember all those questions I asked you? I hope they're getting better and better. <laughs> Shoot. And she's really bare. So to answer your question with regards to uh, is the education system going to do something about um, Latino children in particular, I have concluded, like I, I have concluded, no. And the reason I concluded that is because I reflect upon when I was a kid, and when I was a kid, the majority of Latino kids then were the children of U.S. Um, U.S.-born Chicanos, and the education system didn't do anything for us then. <laughs> really, not going to do anything for the children of immigrants, given the climate of, you know, um, politicalization of immigration right now. So I'm very pessimistic about that. And so I'm not the only one that is pessimistic. Yes, right. <laughs> I and have it's company. Hard because, Misery loves company. It's hard because in my class, you know, we talk, students want to know about the solutions, and I'm just hoping no one's going to ask me because I'm kind of just going to tell them. You know, I'm just very pessimistic that all these problems we've talked about so far are going to be solved. But one thing you said when you, when you were talking about the examples of countries that are doing well, you said that it's because they, could, um, they have very clear goals about their immigration, et cetera. And the thing about the United States is that immigration policy is a federal policy, and here in the United States, immigration is, it happens at the state level and even at the district level. And so, gives me even more reason for pessimism. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, things are not, we're not in a, in a good, uh, uh, at a good uh, moment today. And well, wait till Wednesday, and you're really, when you wake up, you're really gonna feel the pain because <laughs> the country's gonna change dramatically come next Wednesday. On that happy note. <laughs> um, I'm actually writing a book on making migration work, so, but I'm, it's going to be a lot of us in Zealand, I think. When said, but I do want to say, and I want to reiterate, uh, not only thank you for your thoughtful presentation, but I think the more we can humanize and bring people to realize that these are families with, and children with mothers and fathers struggling to make a life in, in whatever place where they are, I think bringing that into the debate is, is crucial for us to have a humane and, and holistic solution to the problem. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you everybody for joining us um, in eating and continuing this conversation and hopefully coming up with even more solutions. And please, we have tons of candy. Eat candy. Happy Halloween. Thank <laughs> you.